Hello, Michael. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? I was just going to do an audio check. Can you hear me, Mark? Uh, coming in loud and clear. Thank you very much. Houston has a liftoff. Uh, yeah, let me fill my water up and we'll okay. see if other people come. Okay, sounds good. So how are you doing? I'm actually doing pretty good, but just navigating here in Southern California, we sent, we've had some hot weather with humidity, and that always drains me. That's right. You're in Riverside. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. Riverside. Good old Riverside. It's a, no offense, but that's a hellhole. <laughs> well, even if I took in offense. The summer, in the summer. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if I took offense, that's my problem, not yours. <laughs> well, it's it's been hot here too, near near a hundred. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which you wow. Know. What about the humidity? Has it been humid too? No, usually the usually it's dry. We yeah, had a little. Okay. We had a we had an overcast day and some rain yesterday or the day before, which cooled it down. At least yeah. for a, at least for a day. Yeah. So what have uh, you been up to? Uh, I try and stay out of trouble, but I don't manage to. Well, I thought we had a conversation about stay with the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> there was, uh, I, there was, uh, yeah, there was a, a, a paper or something about that. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, well, I can't. I can't. Yeah. That's a. I, that's almost a, a personal flaw is I seem to uh, just well, dive, I, in, dive okay, into so it. I feel I'm free enough to kind of push back on you. You're a little gruff sometimes, even for my taste, and I've been around really gruff people. <laughs> I'm I'm a maintenance worker, so when you work in maintenance, you get a lot of gruffness and and I can handle pretty much, but sometimes uh, I'm just saying what it, how it lands on me is I'm going, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, you know, I'll take responsibility for it, and I don't want you to be any other way. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I don't think I can be. I think yeah. I'm much. I think I'm much. Uh, uh, the word nice. I don't like the word nice, but. I'm I'm not as as tough or as gruff as I used to be when I was younger. I can tell that. <laughs> I can tell. Believe me, I can tell. <laughs> and and you know it's it's funny. Sometimes that sometimes that serves you well. You yeah. mean me or, yeah. or people yeah. like me, but sometimes it doesn't. Right. It, it's a it's a skill set. That's the way I look at it. Is a skill set of when to kind of bring some skill of how to bring that forward and when not to. I mean, oh well. Well, yeah. That's the that's the that's the trick is being able to you know sort of manage your personality. I, you know, right. really well adjusted people can do that. Well, I think the – sorry to interrupt, but the skill set that's kind of left unspoken is there's a skill set of how to receive other people's gruffness or opinions. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi. This me? is my, Mike Stump. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's – it. it's just uh, – those are things that, that, you know, people work on. In therapy, 
No, I work. I work on it in the street. I don't work on it in therapy. I've had my fill of therapy. Well, there you go. Uh, you know, not all therapy works either. Yeah, but I've had some that was good. But it's helped me hone my skills in the street. <laughs> if if nothing else, just own my shadow side. <laughs> so let's catch Jeffrey and Marco. Yeah, up. yeah. Uh, I thought they the screen would be played out where we could see everybody. You can change the um, layout of your screen. If you go up to where it says speaker view or gallery view, there's a little- Oh, okay, button. thank you, Marco. Right, that lets you alternate. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we'll wait till Ed and, and shows up. He's, there he is, hi, Ed. Uh, Michael and I were just having a conversation before Jeffrey, Marco, and yourself showed up, uh, and and Michael, I commented that uh, I I I can't stay out of trouble, and uh, and Michael commented that he finds my uh, approach sometimes gruff, and uh, so we were talking about how to how to how people try and manage their personal little personalities, quirks and whatnot. And I said, I'm not nearly as tough and gruff as I used to be when I was younger. I actually think I've made some progress. <laughs> yeah. And I said, I, you, huh? <laughs> and I said, I could, I could feel how he was in the back. Uh, back when, because I come from maintenance and I've had a lot of run-ins <laughs> with gruff people. <laughs> I've had to, I've had to be uh, interact with gruff people and stand my ground, and also learn to listen to them, even if if they are a little gruffy. Well, I grew up in New York. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> so I'm not talking about going to the market. <laughs> It was, it, not much is going to phase me. It was Long, Long Island, right? It was Long Island. It was, it was soft New York. <laughs> Long Island's pretty tough. Except for, I don't know, the Hampton. Depends on the neighborhood. Depends on the, the Hampton. Ha Hampton. Yeah, no, no, that's not where I would go. Yeah, I, I had Hardcore a New York. suburbs here. Yeah, I had a New York friend that uh, taught me that New Yorkers consider conversation sport. You just lay it out on the table and go have a beer afterwards. It's sport. Uh, so. my, my, my psych girl, that's who I call this person that I worked with, uh, she's from New York. And uh, we were having a similar conversation, and, and she suggested, well, why don't you go back to New York? Because that's where my family roots are, <laughs> and I, I, you know, no, I love, I love it here in Colorado. Well, there's there are many good reasons to leave New York, <laughs> <laughs> and not go back. Yeah. Are you saying it's a nice place to be from? <laughs> <laughs> that's been my experience. I, I, uh, okay. Uh, there, there's much to love there as well to be, to be there. And, um, you know, one can definitely, um, battle out a living, uh, and, and, and existence there. But I, I think, I think just existing in New York is kind of a battle. That's, that's why I'm in Colorado. <laughs> well, that's so, uh, so what's the topic there? I mean, there's something about personality. There's something about differences. There's something about like how to how how um people from different parts of the world or different cultural backgrounds or different um ways of constructing their per their selves presenting themselves uh how they um what happens when they interact because you know the gruff manner would do really well in new york um but it may not do well in you know, other places like I know, like local politics, for example, <clears throat> here in Co in Longmont, Colorado, it's still local politics. You know, it, it has its issues, but people are generally at least at least where I live civil. They generally can get can get along. They can generally get things done. Um, 
you know, I've lived here for 11 years now. Uh, I've gone to a number of city council meetings. And it's not that there isn't disagreements and personality issues and things like that, and sometimes deeper issues. But there's a certain kind of coolness, a kind of pragmatism, you know, that I think happens where there's more space, like where uh, there's a little bit more room and kind of uh, where you could, I don't know, I think that there, a different attitude develops depending on the geography. Well, different personalities I, can thrive. Well, I think, uh, and there's a, there's a chapter, I just finished rereading it in the book that I'm working on called Community. And, and we had a conversation way earlier where I said the place that I live it's not really a community like Longmont, a small town. It's a, an apartment complex. And there's like 600 people or, or so, I'm just guessing. Uh, and there's no, yeah, there's everybody's civil. Everybody's, I, I think when people face each other, they're, they tend to be more civil for the most part. And 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 I think uh, I think this screen te- this this social media is just brought out the worst in people in a lot of ways. It just makes it so easy to be uh, hostile, nasty, because you don't. There's almost no consequence. Mm. Uh, uh, it I seems think that's that across the board too. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your persuasion. Uh, certain incidents can cause people to get activated. I uh, I understand Marco's notion of cool, but I'm from Southern California, and I'm all for cool. But sometimes, at least my experience in Southern California, uh, they kind of use coolness as a way to push you out if you you know if they feel you're not being cool based on their agenda. Mm. So, you know, and and that's what I was trying to tell Mark is I think part of what's lost is understanding the skillfulness of how to receive people that are not, are being uncool. How do we receive them and not lose our cool, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. uh, because a lot of people that lose their cool, in my experience, um, both personally and, and trying to look at it in the big picture, sometimes it's they, for whatever reason, I don't understand they don't feel like they're being heard. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Sure. But I mean, when I speak online, when I speak, uh, when I write online in social media, whatever context, I'm just as careful what I say as when I speak out loud. You know, exactly. I mean, exactly. I, mean I, I see these people do these, say these terrible things, and I go, you know, I would never in a million years say a thing like that online or offline, you know, so it's a bit tricky to understand what's going on with people, I, I find. with this. Sort of yeah, thing. I agree, Jeffrey. Uh, the skill set is, it doesn't matter if you're face-to-face or online to me. I mean, that's the way I look at it. You're a genteel sort, Jeffrey. You, you've cultivated it. <laughs> <laughs> In your whole manner. I mean, this inside, outside, uh, I mean, it's totally consistent, I think. And um, I think part of what social media and the online technologies offer is an outlet for modes of expression that might not find um, a place in a kind of more constrained environment, right? Uh, hello. Here's our New York component after speaking. <laughs> you, you decided to forego the cool library. Well, I just got back from the gym. And I just wanted to see if you guys were talking about anything interesting. <laughs> no, but to tell you the truth, the topic of no topic doesn't interest me very much. So I hope you guys have figured out something. I'm listening. <laughs> Well, what do you think, Ed? What what what, what should I think? Oh, I, don't know. I mean, what we should talk about? No. I I was I was intrigued by the fact that you said you might be dragging something over from the uh, from the last uh, Orobindo session because a lot of what what we've been talking about are leading up to now how we 
how we act in different environments has something to do with how we even perceive reality to begin with. And that, that was the whole topic of that, the Aurobindo. I, I thought it was a very fast. This was, this was the one I really enjoyed listening to. I usually have trouble spending two hours watching people talk on tape, but, but, but it was actually uh, very good, not just because uh, 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 Dorisha was there, but it also because people were interacting with each other, as well as, you know, like one to many, it was a many to many kind of interaction, which I, I thought was very nice. And, and all of the things that, that led up to this little get together tonight also have to do with that idea of, um, well, how, how do I actually perceive the world around me and how real do I think it is? Because the less real I think it is, the more options I believe I could have to just do whatever the hell I want. And, and people tend to do that. But I don't think many people have thought about, you well, know, how, how is it with me in my world? You know, that's, that's the kind of thing. That's what was the, kind of like the backstory for me to show up here this evening. Mm. Well, I was having trouble remembering exactly what you were referring to in terms of carrying over a topic because there were, there were a number of topics. But what I think for me is at issue what i think is the, the core topic is ultimate reality or what mm -hmm. we might call ultimate reality mm -hmm. now we can't just talk about ultimate reality lightly right <laughs> we have to <laughs> no but then but, well, we but, can but about right. it. <laughs> yeah we, we can and and it's 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 really behind every everything else i mean it always lurks in the background I don't care how you, you know, for me at any rate, I don't care how you, you go about it. It's always lurking back there somehow, even if that's not what I'm addressing directly. What, would you define what you mean exactly by ultimate reality? Do you mean a shared reality that persists for, for everyone, no matter what they think or their perspective? Is that what you mean? Well, by I, th I mean, that's no. the, that's the not, that's the matter of, I think, discussion is what yeah. one would mean by, by ultimate reality. I mean, those are signifiers. Those are words. I, I just spoke them. They're in, they're in English and they, you know, they're going to be interpreted in certain ways, but I'm, there's something I think that Aurobindo, for example, is writing and teaching about and that various other writers and authors that artists that you know and we ourselves all are talking about in one way or the other you know getting our piece of the elephant or whatever it is um but i think that aurobindo in particular has a sense of ultimate reality that's quite distinct from say um richard dawkins uh what what they would mean by ultimate reality would be described in very different terms, and those terms would lead to very different kinds of discourses. And so I think that to understand Aurobindo or anybody who's making reference to uh, you know, the, uh, an ultimate reality, a being of beings, an absolute you know, aspect, or I don't even, it's, it's the ineffable in many ways, it's difficult to talk about, but the, 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 the I, don't, <laughs> I lose my, 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 my ability to, to say it, but in Aurobindo, Aurobindo's ultimate reality is what he calls Satchidananda, being, consciousness, bliss. And he goes, spends many pages uh, unpacking what that means and how that manifests through all the different layers and aspects of the reality that, that we experience. So that starting point leads to a whole set of um, possibilities that are not necessarily going to be there if the starting point is nothing is at the center of reality. You, we just peel the you peel the onion layers off, you know, from the material level to the atomic level to the quantum level and to, to whatever we can you know, we can find that's deeper than that. Uh, if if there's nothing there, if if there isn't some, then it seems that the possibilities for you know what could be brought forth ultimately in terms of a cosmos are are foreclosed. Uh, it seems to be a dead end, uh, and so I think that 
part of the, I mean, the, the qu question for me, reading Aurobindo, but also reading various other authors and having this interplay of perspectives is gaining some perspective on that, that fundamental question. What is ultimate? What is ultimately real? Uh, what is both ultimately true, but ultimately of concern as well uh, for the, you know, for the, for the community that is discussing these things here. Can I ask a question? Ultimate reality. And what is reality before ultimate reality? Well, I'll, I'll. Uh, he, did I, you finish? Was I, that the I, response I, you wanted to offer us? Because I think you were just starting something. Is the question addressed to? Yeah, I was addressing it to you, Mark. To me personally? Yeah. Ultimate reality. You're the ones who brought this up. Mm -hmm. And ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. And what is reality before ultimate reality? It's, uh, to answer that would be um, beside the point in a way, because the, uh, I, I, the phrase is not um, a philosophical proposition. But that's, a, but that's the phrase you used. It is the phrase I used. It's, because <laughs> reality is ultimate reality. I mean, if we were talking about reality, ultimate is just a way of... Um, pointing to that space that would be at the core of a metaphysical claim, of a metaphysical interpretation. So I would say for Aurobindo, reality has many shapes, forms, expressions, um, dimensions, perspectives, etc. But ultimate reality for Aurobindo would be Satchitananda. That's what I would say. But ultimate reality for me that, that that would be that's the work of my life that's the work that's the that's the being of this of, of my existence so so would you title this talk if you were to title this conversation would it be ultimate reality i don't know we have that conversation hasn't finished yet no it hasn't it has it's just getting started and and, and I'm just trying to understand what the terms basic terms are and Johnny, maybe it's the questions that matter, not the answers. So, I think there's a relationship between questions and answers. And that's the relationship I, I'm curi most curious about. And, and I like to ask open-ended questions about the language people actually use. Yeah. So if, if I were to throw out a provisional question uh, that could be the title of a talk, it would be, well, this would be maybe a, a kind of building block for what could become a question. So just a sort of uh, um, provisional. Um, it would be, what is ultimate reality? So I, I kind of stay away from that word, reality. I don't like it. I never use it. If I can, if I can avoid it, I will. <laughs> See, one of those reality, words that means everything. Reality or just the word. <laughs> we have different things to trigger us, and this this triggers me into the twilight zone really fast. <laughs> I'm very interested in becoming, just like I don't care for the word being very much. I like the word becoming a lot, but and everyone tend, triggered by different things or attracted to different words. And so. I tend to go for experience. You know, not necessarily, phenom necessarily only in a phenom phenomenological sense, but experience as felt or as, as, as rather than reality, which I don't know anything really about. Experience I know something about. Reality I don't think I know anything about. And, and I, uh, I, ha I know what that's about, felt. I feel things a lot, so that makes sense to me. Well, I was, go I was going there. But I, I, I want to come back to uh, the book I'm writing on the very first page. Uh, I use a, a, a definition of reality from Philip K. Dick, the writer, 
fictionalist, and he says reality is that which doesn't go away even if you don't believe it. I think that's a pretty good working definition, which would, I think, uh, be contrary to your Aurobindo. He believes reality is bliss, which comes back to feeling, John. I think part of reality is the, the difference between uh, pleasure and pain. Pain is that that it's real. It's is hard it, to argue that it isn't. It, is it? I, I mean, science doesn't know what pain is. But you do. I mean, you feel it, but I don't know if you know what it is, even if you feel it. Talk more about that. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's really interesting to look at the science of pain because neurologically it's not understood at all. Even though it seems like it should be, it's not. It, it seems to be at least partly psychological and partly neurological. And, and, and finding the, the boundary between those two is tricky. Sure. It, it, it's... And understanding it as an as a felt experience is again tricky. So, I, 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 I think pain is a very interesting topic, um, but I don't think there's anything simple about it. It dry it <laughs> drives our it drives our economy. <laughs> Most of it, a lot of our economy is is built on uh, relieving pain, psychological, emotional, physical spiritual if you want to throw that one in there also the real is a is a deep philosophical category and question um we could find endless interpretations of of what it means and what it would be uh, and how we would encounter it or know it or experience it or define it um thomas de zengotita wrote a book called mediated where you know, he's arguing that um, we, we almost can't have an unmediated experience. That the media, by which he means kind of broadly, not just the technical technical media, but everything, anything that would come in between, that would <laughs> that, that that would inform an experience. Um, that that we almost can't we can't even imagine a non-mediated experience in that sense. But and, and so in that sense, all experience and all me being mediated is not quite real. Uh, it's mutable. But there are certain experiences, he said, when we come to the edge of what can be mediated, where we kind of face a, um, an outside to, that, to, to the spheres and to the kind of um, experiences that media creates. He calls that the real. It's like, I think, Mark, you, you shared a... Um, a video of a, a man who was lost in the Amazon and um, was on the brink of death. He came to an extreme where, in, and he wanted to, to he, it wasn't that he wanted to commit suicide, but he didn't know if he wanted to go on living, to go on trying to live. And he put himself down. He, in a sense, surrendered. He surrendered himself to that place. And then he had a vision. And I wanted to argue that that vision was real because it came at that edge beyond his personal mediation. So I think we could talk about the real in interesting ways because, you know, I think the counter argument to that vision being real was that it was a hallucination. I wanted to say, no, that vision was real. But it was a hallucination produced by the brain. It was, you know, totally explicable in terms of his, you know, evolutionary psychology. He saw, uh, you know, uh, the, the, how we construct those arguments, I would want to argue, is part of the reality that we end up experiencing. So, well, to stay with that, that uh, experience of that guy and uh, reality, I would say it's 
pretty easy to say the reality was he was dying from lack of nourishment. He, he had been 18 days and he, he had eaten very little and his body had taken, uh, you know, great, uh, you know, stress. And, and so his body was shutting down and his, his brain was, was still active for, for a little while. Uh, but if they, ha if he hadn't been rescued, then he, he probably would have expired within, you know, a day or something. Uh, so, so I, I, my definition is that's real. Hung, hunger is real. Pain is real. Even though it may some, some pain. I mean, I just went through that terrible experience. Uh, and I was, uh, uh, you know, if I hadn't been able to alleviate the pain I was in, I, I was gone. It was done. Uh, but I do believe the pain was, um, I hate to say it, but I think it was, the pain was real, but the, it was psychological. It was driven by, by, you know, thoughts in my head. All right, let me ask what might be a bad question. Is that pain ultimately real? Is the pain mm -hmm. ultimately real? Yeah. I, I, yes. Okay. It was abs yeah, it was absolutely real. But it was also, I, so what generated it would be a question. It wasn't like I was lost in the jungle <laughs> with nothing to eat. I had plenty to eat. Plenty to, you know, plenty of water, plenty, you know. Mm -hmm. I was fine. Do you, is what generated it real? Well, it goes back to the beginning of our conversation. What, what generated it was hostile uh, communication from other people. So I would, I, I think the best word would be betrayal. I felt betrayed and it manifested in physical pain. I couldn't, I, I don't think I could deal with the reality that, that people I thought were, were, you know, friends would, would turn so hostile. It just, it, it was un, it was unbelievable. I couldn't wrap my head around it. And, and so it manifested itself in physical pain to the point where I couldn't move. Because physical pain is the body telling you you're in trouble, right? Physically. That's yeah. What it, I mean, that's what it does, physical pain. Well, but it was, but, but it was, it was generated by thoughts. It wasn't like I, I hit my uh, hammer on my hand or something like that. No, I agree. I've had uh, psychic, I don't know what you call it, psychic pain or experiences where I know what's going on is purely psychic and yet it feels like physical pain. So I understand that context, but it can't be the same thing as physical pain because physical pain is nerve endings and you know well it's not quite the same it can't be the same thing so, i i i self-diagnosed myself with just from the internet and 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 commercials on tv that it was what people call fib fibromyalgia which is overactive nerves which is basically <laughs> neurosis. I mean, but it's real. And, and some, some people that I know took a medical route, and like with an MD, and they just, they keep throwing drugs at them until they find something that works. But I mean, it is it real according to your definition of real? The the one you gave about Philip Dick? Oh yeah, 
because it 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 in what sense go, is it pain it would not go away it, yeah but it, since your belief is tied in with the pain it, it becomes a bit tricky to untangle the two absolutely absolutely it's tricky so I if think, you took the belief away maybe you would take the pain away too well that's i spent half a year with my psych girl and and <laughs> you know i i, I feel Decent. I put myself at like seventy percent now, where I was at. I was. I was on the. I was on the brink. Did on your a pain, beliefs change the, through the process you, with through the therapeutic process? Did your beliefs change? I think I accepted the reality. These people were not my friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. a hard thing to swallow. And that, uh, Marco was one of the only people who, who didn't abandon me out of my whole network of friends, all the people I know. He's one of the only, you know, just a very few did not abandon me. And that's the, ultimately that's why I showed up here is, is through my, you know, relationship with him. He kept bugging me. Joined. <laughs> I think those were automated emails you were getting. I <laughs> <laughs> mean, it was mindful AI. <laughs> it wasn't you. It was. It was my intention transmitted through mechanical means. Uh, no, no, but, that's not true because we we'd meet for beer, we hung out. And food, and well, movies, and hiking, and all kinds of stuff. Oh well, I think literature goes deeper than politics, uh, and. Um, I think we had a literary relationship before we before um, politics uh, would have divided us. Um, I think that like reading it in jest together, the novel by David Foster Wallace, uh, that was you know a experience. That's right? something yeah. you, we we went through with a number of people, and I think that um, you know the kind of. I mean, it's a book. It's just a book. It's just a novel. It's just his thoughts. It's just words. Um, but I think the effect of it and the effect also of a group of people taking those words seriously in some way, some level, um, was real. So. Would, yeah, it was real. I mean, that, and that was part of, that's what has motivated me to keep doing that, that kind of a thing. So reading Gebser, reading Aurobindo, reading the Minor Gesture or Soul Mountain, or that's one kind of thing that I I think can bring people together. Uh, that politics does, you know, in, in, in a much more factionalizing ways. I think. I I have a question. May I, um, Mark? I apologize for the, the lightning and the thunder. thunder. Nothing I can do. Can you guys hear that? Yeah, yeah that was cool. It's a, very, it's a very big storm. That's why I wanted to get indoors before it happened. Um, it said it was going to last for a couple of hours, a really big storm, and then it's going to stop. Anyway, it was pain. It was ultimately real. It was felt. was and when it was ultimately real what happens now i feel better you feel better <laughs> it was and 24 it was 24 7 it was i was i was on the brink of, of death i could not go on like that and now i feel i feel really you know i'm not i don't feel like i did uh, you know, when I was younger, even your age, John, uh, I don't think I'll ever get, you know, you, we talked about time that, that, I mean, your body ages and, and growing old, uh, you lose your capabilities to do things. And, and you, and you said, now I feel really And now, I'm, I'm repeating back what you just said. And now I feel really, you, you feel better. 
And, 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 and I cut it short. I truncated it to say I'll never feel as good as I did, say, in my, you know, I, I call my peak years my 50s, which Ed is, is said is we're way back in the 30s. <laughs> it's okay, 30s. So there's now. And this now is different from what it was. Absolutely. And Absolutely. that was ultim and that was ultimately real. And now you're feeling better. And is that's, that yes, feeling that's better, real. ultimately real? Yeah. And actually my work with uh, my w work with the psych girl, I never felt so better so good. <laughs> as I did in, in conversation with her. Well, in, as you mentioned, there, it now is feeling better, but there have been other nows which you've experienced as being even better than the better that is now when you were younger. But even though you're older, this feels better than that pain that was ultimately real. And all I'm offering here, which is probably pretty obvious, is that ultimately real changes quite a bit in pe most people's descriptions, as well, Mark I, just demonstrated. So I'm just curious about, well, what, what, is, what is ultimately real when the ultimately real changes? The descriptions of ultimately real seem to be infinite. So, so is your uh, is your is your uh, idea that there is no reality? Is that what you're saying? I, I, I would just say that that's why literature is more interesting than philosophy, too. Uh, <laughs> I'm just saying that something perhaps is becoming because Marco's it's idea not about just it. real, but there's ultimately becoming. And that there's a relationship between becoming and what's real. That is much more interesting to me than well, ultimately real in some abstract, empty, whatever concept. Well, the... the you know, tons of people have written tons of books on this, but I find it equally uninteresting. Well, there's a, there's a uh, therapist, I think he was in the 50s, Carl Rogers, and his seminal book is on becoming a person. And it's, and it's, a, it's a type of, of psychodynamic therapy that he practices, and my psych girl is really good at it. And it's actually, he titles it On Becoming a Person. And I don't know that I've ever felt as good as I did in interaction with that methodology of, of uh, psychodynamic therapy. So, so what you're suggesting to me, and maybe to all of us here, here is that the, mm -hmm. that the past is open-ended. Well, although, Johnny, you were saying about this becoming and, and reality, I think it's a uh, I think that's a, I mean, that's an, that's an insight that speaks to me and relates to the Aurobindo uh, and the kinds of things that Marco was talking about earlier in the sense that, uh, you know, it's some sort of, um, I don't know whether it's an identification or some sort of a, a growing maybe into something that is more universal. I'm I'm avoiding the reality word, but <laughs> well, in in the at the beginning of the conversation before you all got here, Michael and I were talking, and he thought that uh, a lot of people who he encountered, who he thought were angry, were angry because they haven't been heard. 
and and so they they made all this sort of commo commotion as a as a we call it acting out uh, rather than verbalizing the fact that they don't feel like you said Jeffrey recognized so they act out in in these uh, you know hostile extreme ways because they don't feel and you know they feel like nobody's listening to them so Johnny's becoming a plant here well that that, that brings to mind the, the title of a book that um that Doug has introduced I've read I've started reading it I have it on Kindle and I uh, I, I, I enjoy reading it on my Kindle, so I'm waiting to to, to buy the actual copy, but it's like 30 bucks, so I'm putting it off until we're going to get serious and read it. But it's called The Listening Society, and it's by a, a kind of quasi, not pseudonym, pseudonymous author, Hansi Freinacht, uh, and it espouses the principles of a philosophy that this author calls, or these authors, I think it's a, a team, uh, called metamodernism. Uh, and I don't want to talk about it, but exactly because I haven't, you know, I haven't finished reading the book. But the idea of being heard would entail a society that was listening, right? So the basic idea at this, of the book, at the just simplest level, is that a society would be organized around listening to its constituents and, in some way, accommodating uh, them. Um, but that, that, I mean, that's a process, right? And that's the process of communication. That's a, pro that's a mediated process that takes place between people living in, you know, the same conditions, that by which I mean same techno-economic, socio-ecological uh, conditions. And how do you have, I mean, that, that's, I think, what we're trying to do as, a, as people, like as a species. It's like we're trying to figure out how to how to work together you know but a lot of times how do you it's, it's very hard to listen there's so much to, there's so much to hear I mean, there's so much noise and there's so many different voices and they're so um uh competitive uh with each other uh that you know the very the very landscape the very means by which we can listen are already infected by the you know, various agendas that are not necessarily oriented toward a listening society you know, that you know, want to shut their ears, want not to hear, you know, want to fixate on a particular uh, outcome that is desired or agenda that's you know, being executed. Um, so you know, I think that it's, it's a very, it's a very w what they call a wicked, wicked problem uh, that we have. Uh, and I, mean, I hope that part of what we're doing in the Cosmos Cafe is trying to in, a, in, a, in our own very 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 small way but not not non-real not you know necessarily ineffectual way um to address that communication issue that's why i'm here um and uh, i think you know this is a new i think part of what's going on is every we've got all this new technology and and we didn't, uh, it's, it's new. I mean, you know, back to it, Dawkins or, or, or uh, Bindo, uh, you know, we evolved in small groups and that's all our, all our means of communication. Uh, they haven't changed really. Now you, you can argue and maybe he does that there's this, consciousness that we communicate you know that, that, that separate and apart from who we are as a as a physical being you can make that argument i don't buy it but you can make it not necessarily making it but uh, i don't know i don't deny it necessarily either i mean there's all kinds of Ways that, yeah, I mean, we're not all people, you know, maybe not all, maybe not all consciousnesses are persons, all right? We could be becoming persons, but it doesn't mean that everything that would 
be able to communicate with us are becoming persons. I mean, why couldn't, um, is my dog a person? Mubi, she communicates with me, but she's, she's not a person exactly, but she has a lot to say. So how would, <laughs> so, I mean, this is just to, I mean, to ground that a little bit, I mean, one of the issues that I think we are dealing with as human beings on this planet that we call Earth at this time is who gets to communicate, who gets to be counted as a person. Um, the liberal, rational, enlightenment model is that individual human beings are, are the persons and you know, we, we try to expand that definition of personhood out from its original white male property class to include the whole diversity of, of the human family. But that doesn't yet include the earth. It doesn't yet include animal life. It doesn't yet include cosmic existence. Uh, and so there are varying um, ideas about who should be included. Uh, and... I like becoming a person. I, I think I have to work on becoming a person. So I, I'm, I'm uh, glad to hear that you're also you know, doing that because that is what a human being, I think, has to do, is become, become a person. Um, but, but there's also something to be said, I think, to the question of consciousness for the transpersonal perspective because there are not only persons in reality. And not only persons feel pain. Not only persons have desires, not only persons have experiences. And your dog has a lot to say. Um, and pain and desire and experience. And it's raining outside here. It's very dark and very stormy. And that, uh, that ha communicates affect, an affective tone. I'm very aware of my atmosphere is very different from probably the atmospheres that you are in because you're not in this very big storm. And the plant I put out to get some water just turned over may fall off, but I'm not gonna bother about that now. But part of my attention is on that. And affect, what's the relationship between the affective zone that your dog might be in or a cat might be in or the plant that just is wobbling and almost falling off my fire escape? I mean, these are all living creatures and you guys are in different zones probably the weather may be affecting you less dramatically than it's affecting me right now. But I, but I'm, but maybe some of my affect is being communicated to you, this agitation that I'm feeling right now. Um, so I'm just wanting to explore a little bit about affect and emotion and mood and modulating our affects in certain ways to perhaps learn something and also to expand uh, what we may consider right now an individual, isolated, distinct, different, separate from, and yet we all participate in different kinds of rhythms. Um, we come in contact with different kinds of creatures. Um, we we taste something that we don't like. We taste something that we do like. We share the things that we taste that we do like. We may have a beer or a drink with a friend. So these are the kind of things that I believe are very slippery and 99.9% .9 nonverbal because we don't talk about it too much. Yet I'm reminded of what uh, Aaron Manning, the philosopher, some of us are studying together. Her, her husband, Brian Masumi, her partner, I've been reading a lot on him. He's written a book on politics and affect. And he says, all politics is driven by affect and gesture. And at first I said, well, no, I think a lot more is going on. Like coherent arguments. I went, no, I think he's right. People don't give a shit about arguments. 
it's all the, the voice, the tone, the look, the mood, the move. And I believe that's true of uh, our relationships too. Someone tells you that you love them. Okay, you tell me that you love me, but I can see your fists like this and your face is red <laughs> and your voice is constricted. I love you. <clears throat> so I think that we can communicate words and arguments, but it's much more about the tonality that's going to generate affective zones out of which maybe good arguments may come. I'm not sure. So anyway, that's my two cents. I hope that was of use to somebody besides myself. <laughs> Trying to articulate this is not easy. Hello. Uh, thanks, John, because I think uh, I resonate with your articulation because uh, a lot of my interactions just in the recent years, has been more pronounced of paying attention to that. So I can have better articulated arguments. I can't have an articulated argument with somebody if I'm not first regulating my system with how they're responding to me. Uh, I think Dan Siegel talks about neurobiology, that our brains and stuff resonate with each other, and it's it's a science that I think is legitimate. I think it's coming online because <clears throat> um, coming into the reality that I'm not a solid piece of rock, <laughs> even though Paul Simon likes to love me like a rock, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, maybe, maybe I have some rockness, but it vibrates a living energy. So um, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I like, I like that word resonance, when I resonate. I think that's in our, our common usage. And I think yeah. that's for a very good reason because I think it, it's a word that captures that, that quality of that what relational you, field we're in. What do you feel the word attunement? Is that similar? I love that one too. I like attunement. Okay. I don't like I don't like ultimate reality, but I like it. I like. Though <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're all idiosyncratic. I mean, words yeah. some words just rub us the wrong way, and some words we just can dance with. So. Yeah. Right. Well, I practice Zen, and and Zen tells you to sit on the cushion and feel the vibration of the earth. Don't just sit on it. <laughs> feel it from your ass. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I'd like to bring, maybe ch change the subject slightly. Maybe maybe build on what we've talked about so far. And um, also maybe connect a couple of different topics that have come up on the forum. Uh, one was post one was one you posted, Mark. It was a clip of Brett Weinstein, I believe. I think I posted that, didn't I? Yeah, Did you? I didn't. I didn't. That's my I'm fault. Familiar with, I, I'm familiar with him, and I think I watched that, and I watched several of was his. He, was this the, the talk on the social brain? He did do a talk on the social brain. Okay. I uh, think. There was another that Caroline posted, an interview with Douglas Rushkoff on um, growth-based economy in finite world. On a, fine, on, a, on a limited planet. Uh, and the connection between the two is that in the Brett Weinstein clip, his premise is that humans are addicted to growth. And that because of our addiction to growth, which he thinks he argues is biological, um, or at least partly biological, but he presents a kind of ontology with a biological layer and a cultural layer, a genetic layer and a mimetic a kind of interface between the two, but not, but not a symmetry. 
between the two. two. He, he has a particular view on this, that we're destined to play out certain scripts or certain um, either genetic and or cultural scripts when conditions become such that our addiction to growth can't not, cannot be fulfilled. And I, I think this is where argument becomes important because argument represents an objectification of a set of facts or realities that allow us to tie, tie them together into, into a coherent narrative. And he, I believe, is saying, and you know, Brett, along with the, uh, his compatriots and what they call the intellectual you know, dark web, which is a, another topic, but it includes people like people that not, not everybody here I know likes necessarily, <laughs> Sam Harris and um, uh, Weinstein's brother, uh, Eric uh, Weinstein, uh, you know, various others, they want to emphasize the importance of reason, argument, and um, the, 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 and the, the kind of communication, the kind of free exchange of ideas, the debate, etc., that they argue would lead to better results for, for, for humans. But the reason I say that is that if we don't get a perspective on growth, if we, if we can't observe how we behave in objective terms and then craft narratives about those, which then get disseminated and propagated and become kind of a shared reality that allows us to adjust how we manage our behavior, then what Weinstein is arguing is that we are destined to annihilate ourselves in some way. And that's the, that's the danger that, that he sees because this era of abundant growth that we've had since the, ability, since the discovery of oil, fossil fuels, the ability to exploit those combined with technological and scientific innovations that have you know, given us the abundance of the modern world, that's coming to an end, uh, is the argument. And that's what's driving this retribalization. Uh, because we can no longer afford to be um, so so uh, comfortable. Uh, so the question, I mean, that that comes out of that for me is: Can we get a perspective on our addiction to growth, uh, and how would we change our behaviors? if we saw the path that we were truly on. Well, I only recommended him, not because I like him particularly, or his brother, Eric. I think they're very smart guys, but they hang out with Dave Rubin too much and, you know, and Sam Harris, who I don't think they're, is as smart as they are actually. But what I liked about, and, and I think they're very, they, I think they're narrow and deep, whereas I just think Sam Harris is just very narrow. <laughs> um, but anyway, I don't want to critique them or waste my time or your time critiquing them. But what I liked about him was he said, we have to say no to biological evolution. Um, he doesn't have anything to replace that with once you say no to it. I think Aurobindo does. I think there are various kinds of the new human, um, transhuman, posthuman. There are many different inflections. I think some of them actually don't sound like the new human, but the old human just refitted uh, with this uh, infinite growth of Fantasia operating, like going off to Mars and colonizing Mars and the rest of the, you know, the rest of the system in the next a thousand years, I've heard a physicist talk about this. Um, you know, with the same kind of attitude that, you know, Europe colonized Africa. You know, basically that's the same attitude, but they want to take it um, cosmic. So I think Aurobindo is offering a different kind of human, uh, uh, new human. And so I agree, narratives are going to be necessary. Um, I, I feel like, well, we'll Part of that new human would be at new, new kinds of affects and new kinds of satisfactions that would make it easier to say no to biological evolution, which basically says 
breed as much as possible, as many babies as you can before you die. That's it. That's biological evolution in a nutshell. And this, I think Brett was saying, is, 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 hasn't, there's no future for us. We have to override this biological uh, imperative. And, uh, he, and he also said the system is broke. There's no, 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 no one, the, the left nor the right, have any policies at all for a sustainable ecological civilization. And I do think Aurobindo has an interest in, in ecological civilization. I have a big interest in that. I, I think suspect some of you do as well, as we've talked about Jennifer Gidley and integral theory and planetary futures, multiple futures, not just one neoliberal cookie cutter stamp corporate driven future for them. I think these are in the air right now, and I think it's driven by our uh, by the affective uh, subliminal uh, liminal zones, and I believe we need to pay very good attention to those affective zones because I think that's where the action is, and I think a, a good writer like Gary Lockman is exploring this in his recent book Dark Star Arising, where he's talking about um, the magical thinking of some persons and different places of the world, some of them have a great deal of power. Um, and Putin and, um, and uh, our president are shaking hands, having a love fest right now. <clears throat> so I think all of this is related, uh, but I think it's, before we get too global, I think it's really important to like, look at those, the, the mi micro perceptive level that we're all operating with in very, very subtle kinds of, uh, uh, and hard to put into words some of these affective zones. And I think our skill level, if we got more skillful at that, we would be deriving more satisfaction from our relationships. And I think we could be moving towards, minor gestures, no doubt, towards something like an ecological civilization if we were paying better attention than we are right now. So thank you for bringing that up, the thing about narratives. I think it's very important. Okay, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to comment that I have a kind of a dissidence of why why affect and cognitive reasoning can't work together, and I wonder if we're at a point in humanity of how to juggle them kind of together. Uh, I have trouble with Sam Harris because in his critique, he doesn't really bring in how important it is to have a feeling for how, what direction is our reasoning going. I mean, you know, reasoning has has a feeling to it. I can I can feel when I've been in situations, I can feel when I'm fucking myself up <laughs> if I paid attention because I'm following a certain line of reasoning <laughs> but reasoning also comes into play to help me not let my impulse of, of overwhelm of effect take over either so i've spent the last five ten years out of because of my uh a tractor accident trying to kind of reboot and take responsibility of how i do both which is a different skill set than doing it either one separately it's a different skill set to me it seems like so, so it's juggling, you say, this concept. Yeah, I like the aspect of juggling because, you know, it's like, okay, here's a fact. Oops, here, you know. And I like it because you're doing it at the same time. Yeah, yeah. 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 And the center, the center of the juggling is me, you know, my personhood. <laughs> But isn't it a kind of hubris to think that we humans are going through to through rational discussion and argument arrive at changing society for the better? I don't think it works that, that way at all. I, I agree with Brian Masumi's idea that politics is about affect and and what was the other thing you said? Um, justice. Gesture. Justice. Gesture. No, gesture. No, gesture. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, you know, that it has to do with things that are built into the way, in, into the sort of human nature 
and its relationship to the environment, and that that's what determines our future, not rational argument. And I don't, I don't think it that it works quite that way, you know. But Jeff, I, what about policy making? How are we going to do policy by affects alone? I'm not. I'm just saying that it doesn't. Ultimately, it's not policy that determines what happens. It's it's the evolution of society in a very broad way, far beyond the level of policy that determines what's going. I mean, we're in trouble with the environment because we've got this. We've had this growth culture. The same thing what Mark, Mark Marco was talking about, and the growth culture has led us into this direct conflict with the environment. But the growth culture came in a period when growth was encouraged by the environmental context within we, 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 which we're in. But growth is no longer encouraged by it. Growth is now the, uh, the wrong approach to take, and we have to cap things. Well, it's going to take time, but eventually those different ways of, are going to impact on the culture in the larger sense. And, you know, I, I reasonably, I'm not entirely optimistic that it will work that way, but I'm reasonably optimistic that, but I don't think it has to do with us getting together and deciding on anything. I think it has, it emerges from the dynamics of populations and history and forces that are far beyond the individual. But other people disagree with you. I know they do. <laughs> They're making plans. <laughs> You're making big plans to <laughs> Silicon Valley and we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see who's right. <laughs> well, well, I guess to add to what you're saying, Jeffrey, and I, I see your point. Uh, I guess I just take it. I think I was watching you guys uh, do the Aaron Manning, and and just feeling it as being 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 part of the field and whatever little ripple and letting go into the, you know, whatever big changes are coming. Does that make sense? Well, I, I think the minor gesture is perfectly minor doable. Gesture, yeah, that, I, it's yeah. perfectly doable at the human level, but I don't think the okay. major gestures okay. are doable okay. in the same way. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. That's, That's what I like cool. about the minor gesture is that, uh, it's like on the cutting edge of the major. I mean, you can't totally ignore it to me, you know, but I'm going to end up citing on the minor jester as being my influence. I think po policy is a kind of minor gesture. I mean, when, when I go to the city council meetings, I don't go very often, but when <laughs> I've gone to the city council meetings, uh, they're debating over, you know, minutia of line items on the municipal budget and little things like, you know, how you deal with um, uh, zoning regulations, like how you deal with uh, traffic. I mean, things like that in the cumulative are what actually constitute the, the, the world that, that we end up living in. So I think that the gestures, the kind of grand movements, the affects, they ultimately concretize into specific decisions which are made, a multitude of those, and the totality of them is reality. Um, so... I mean, to what Michael was saying before, the juggling of the affect and the cognitive, I think that, I mean, that's really what is um, needed. And I like that you said it's, it's a different skill because just being able to be effective, just being able to perform, just having that is one way of conducting oneself. Uh, thinking and making argumentation is another. Uh, but then to have to let them be distinct because the, the you know argument unfolds according to its own rules uh, so does affect and at the same time to um uh keep them both in play keep them both in the air uh that's uh that, that's uh, i think closer to what someone like uh, gebser or aurobindo or wilbur would call integral uh, it, it's more it's more integrated uh it's not even that it ends, you know, it's a kind of something you have to continue doing uh, because these forces are so dynamic and they're so, they're so in play and it's very easy to drop one ball over the other. Right, right, exactly.
Uh, and it's never ending, too. I mean, I've definitely dropped some balls here and there. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't even, you know, we haven't yet brought in the other ball. Yeah. <laughs> what the ultimate ball? <laughs> the ultimate. <laughs> I meant the so- I meant the soccer ball. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the football. Yeah. Well, that's the world. We're world, you know. <laughs> the World Cup. <laughs> yeah. Ed, you haven't said anything in a while. Sometimes it's very nice to just listen. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm personally a big fan of our feelings tell us what to think. And I don't, I don't believe that for all of our argumentation and reasons and whatever we verbalize has very, very little effect on what we actually do. And the only thing that matters in life is what you do how you act in a given situation, how you react to a certain situation. And we spend a whole lot of time looking at how those things play out and then describing that in some kind of coherent way because we then believe that, well, we understand what's going on. But but I don't think that we do. And... Part of the reason for that is, is that we don't we don't think about why we feel the way we feel about things. I'm I I my hairs stand up in the back of my neck when I hear people talking about feelings, emotions, and impulses all in one breath because they're not the same thing. And when we talk about resonating, for example, that's a feeling. That as, as far as I can tell, there is nothing rational intellectual, cognitive about resonating at all. It's felt through our entire bodies, and it's a pure tuning or not tuning, reacting to or whatever to some vibration that we feel. It all comes in through this feeling. I mean, everything in the end is vibration. And we either feel that we are in tune with that or we're in some kind of disharmony. And it's that I believe that what drives us to everything else that we do. We like to color it with a lot of things, but it, but it, at the very root level, it's about this feeling. And so whether, you know, you can go to the city council. I used to go to city council meetings when I was in California, because I thought maybe that was this thing I was supposed to do. And, and I was just amazed at what they never talked about. And, but what is so patently obvious, you know, we, we, every community has, issues and problems that need to be resolved. But for some reason, those don't really get addressed because there's too much involved. There's too many interests. There's too many feet that are going to get stepped on. There's too many, whatever it is. And so we avoid that because we, we don't, haven't learned as human beings how to actually interact with our feelings. They, they you know, they're, they're our main driver and that's what always gets in the way as I see that. And so and so I, you know, I really appreciate that this whole effect side has come up because I, I think it is the driver of everything else that we do. And we have so little understanding of what it actually means for us. We, we focus too easily and too readily on what appears to be um, some kind of line of argumentation or justification or facts. You know, why is it that people don't uh, react to facts anymore? There's been a, a whole slew of studies that have been done recently that have sh- demonstrated rather conclusively that presenting people with factual evidence does not change their mind about how they feel about something or what how they view something. So if we're impervious to facts, what's what's driving us? And to me, that must be our feelings. And we don't understand them at all. I I think that's a I'm in agreement with my, much of what you said, and I resonate definitely. But I don't think we're, uh, I think we do know a lot more than we pretend that we know. I think when we're safe and secure and we're resonating with certain others, we're more likely to let down our guard and share 
the non-ordinary experiences that many of us have had, which do not fit into the current paradigm of what reality is. Um, I've been uh, committed to making that happen on this, in this particular space. And I was uh, rewarded because I felt many people were as odd, if not more odd than I am, and we're pretty okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, John, we're not more odd. <laughs> we love your oddness. <laughs> it, <that's> odd. <laughs> I'm, definitely, I'm definitely a believer in the deviant. Mm -hmm. That the deviant is, not, um, is deviant for very good reasons, and we need to pay attention rather than sweep it under the rug and pretend it, it's not happening. So I think we're, we, we know quite a bit, actually. And I think uh, an author like Aurobindo is pretty open about how much he knows, which is quite a bit. And he's assuming you know quite a bit, too, or he wouldn't be even bothering writing all these books. So I want to put that out there on the table also. Yeah, and, and I agree with you, John. I just want to emphasize one aspect. When you, when you talk about a lot of these experiences that you have, you know, very often you use visual imagery to help us get a picture of what's going on. But the key phrases and the key terms that are used are always effective. They're always about a feeling. You know, when Gapes had told you to listen with your third ear, it's not like he said it. It's like you felt it. And, and, I, and that's, that is also a reality. It's not my everyday reality. But it is a reality in which I firmly believe that that, that, that occurs. But it occurs in a different way, let's say, in a different media or a different mode or however we describe that than what we do with our everyday reality. And that's, to me, that's, that's most fundamental. And that's why I also, and that, this is why I agree with you, the other point that you made, John, about Aurobindo. He's describing, it's like Steiner in that regard. Steiner never, sa he says, I see this. But when, but when pressed in any way, shape, or form, you always come down to, well, I felt it's this way. It's this feeling that you get. And that feeling that we have, and we've all had them, I'm sure every one of us, whether we like to admit it or recognize it or acknowledge it or not. And it's that feeling that we need to get closer to and more in touch with and, and get a better handle on, if you will, if we are going to do anything that would remotely look like progress or get to a better or wherever we're going to go. That, to me, that's, that's the, the core behind that. That's what I wanted to, wanted to say there. Um. <laughs> It, there seems there seems to be a step that uh, it's just from my experience from being traumatized several times in my life to get to what Ed is saying as far as feeling. Um, through socialization, trauma and stuff, we aren't taught how to feel safe with our feelings, whether they're good, bad or indifferent. We're not, I think that's a step that the ground step that we got to know how to feel with, feel uh, safe with our physiological experience, our feelings, you know, affect. And a lot of us um, are not taught that. I've had to learn that myself to, to embrace out of trauma that the best way for me to heal was to turn towards gently, slowly back and 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 down regulate the hyper vigilance of trying to protect myself from my own negative experience of taking a tractor over the side of a, a road and thinking I was dead <laughs> and then coming back to life and going what the fuck had just happened and it's take and that was 18 years ago so I, it, that's why I think say it, this notion of safety with our feelings not that there's, I, I want to emphasize, there's no absolute secure safety. <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a mature skill of learning how to be safe internally with ourselves. And the only way I've come to work with that is having like John and, and, and I think Ed has taught, of doing it with other people that have modeled it to me, like you guys are doing right now, listening to me. And, and I agree. It's 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 feeling safe enough. Cause yeah, also, safe enough. Yeah, because because yeah, I agree. That's important. Because with our own feelings, with our own, you know. And if you feel safe enough to share it, that doesn't mean everyone's going to be 
in total agreement yeah. with anything you may be sharing, no. but there's no. there's an, no. there's enough tolerance in the space that yeah. it can support differences that it, then those differences are not held with contempt. Yeah, and I've been willing to sit with the dissidents <laughs> that comes with it <laughs> because not everybody are, is going to agree, but okay. There's all kinds of ways to make music as far as I'm concerned. So, um, actually, so individually, uh, we grow emotionally or we deal with our emotions. I mean, I'm speaking from my own experience by re-exposing us ourselves to, for instance, traumatic, not always, but, but often that kind of work leads to a, a slow, better ability to process one's own, one's emotions. Um, right. And but one might, and I'm sort of venturing out on a limb here, suggest that the same thing might apply to larger groups of people than individuals. So, larger mm -hmm. groups of people who re-encounter as a group uh, traumatic or difficult issues emotionally may, in a sense, process them and lead them to the better thing. So, one of the so. Uh, the, that leads me to a reflection about the current state of the world. So, for instance, um, one of the, about 15 years ago, I used to, when I went to the cinema, I used to think, uh, all the films are, they're so simplistic. They don't go into the darker side of human beings and what's going on underneath in human beings. Well, all that's changed now. In the cinema now, it's quite dark. A lot of the stories go into the darker side of what it means to be human. And I, say, you know, and some, I hear some people say, oh, this is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I think human beings culturally through the media of, of films are beginning to, as a group, connect in with some of these issues about, what it, what, about the harder side of what it is to be human. Um, to, and, and then if I might venture even further, I mean, the whole discussion around Trump and immigration and, and, um, and uh, you know, the, so, I mean, clearly there's a lot going on that's really bad there. But overall, you could make an argument that what is going on collectively is that we are, as a society, reconnecting with some of these issues in ways that may ultimately be useful and move us forward as a society rather than necessarily be negative all the time. Um, in, and indeed, the right, like Hannah Arendt's writing or the writings around the Holocaust in the Second World War, these things modify how we look at these things. In the 1940s, when people were looking at these events, they didn't have the same baggage that we have today when we look at these things going on in our world. And I think the, the cultural baggage also is that the, 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 that presence of this other discussion in relation to these things also affects how we feel about them in a cultural way. So, you know, despite what I said earlier about not being able to change the larger scripts of what's going on, I meant at the intellectual level. But at the feeling level, I do think there is a processing that's going on in the larger society that has more to do with feeling than it has to do with thought. And, and is there a relationship between that intellectual level and thought and that that feeling good question i mean that's to me um uh, we were talking about resonance and affects and the intellect and it can't just come from um our our, our goals our intellectual goals that we formulate and we try to make turn into policy that there's something that's um more affect and feeling tones and hard to put into words that's operating in most people's lives very dramatically it's it's driving much of their behavior so i'm just interested yeah, uh, my feeling, i'm sorry it, did, maybe it's part of what michael was talking about the juggling 
between the thought and the feeling. It's, the, it's not that the thought determines what we do. It's that the thought allows us to think through feelings in a somewhat different way. And then we apply the feelings and the learning in a different way. And, and that's the juggling that's going on. That's right. So the intellectual level is supported, can be supported by the affective yeah. zone. Yeah. If, if there's enough reflective capacity. In, yeah. the, in the person or the groups that we're in. Obviously, not everybody is doing that, but... Uh, no, no, not, a lot of people are not doing it yeah. at all. <laughs> but I think what you, what you talked about, um, the, the, how cinema has changed and the, the, the baggage that we have uh, accumulated. And um, I'm thinking of the, 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 some of the differences that were being brought up by um, Banerjee and his conversation and his talk about the postmodern and how Aurobindo was an, a, a modern writer and, and um, how he and Banerjee is coming from a much more postmodern uh, kind of uh, feeling. And I think, I think that's how we're, and is there something beyond, like, like people are t speculating about the post-rational, is there something beyond this rational phase that many of us have, have uh, become very attached to and it becomes deficient as Gebser would say, that the mental structure becomes extremely fragile when it um, fails to appreciate that there are other structures like the magical and the mythic and the archaic, which are extremely influential and from which the mental structure has emerged. So to deny those previous structures is, is, is suicidal. So I'm just wondering if there's any, is there, is there any space, any wiggle room, as Brian Masumi says, for us, so that we can um, use the healthy mental structures and supply and add to the, the healthy mental, uh, what is, uh, you know, has been perhaps um, not considered um, like the magical and the mythical. So I think that's the baggage that I think we carry over and the postmodern drift, which I feel like so many of us get caught up in because we don't have any goals anymore, because we're oh so postmodern. And it's not cool if you're postmodern to have any goals. You're just supposed to drift endlessly. And I just wonder if that's not something that we need to go beyond. Um, I understand it, I appreciate it, that there's so much more going on than I'm ever gonna come up with or you're gonna come up with, but I think we still, I, th I think we still need to find ways of articulating goals that we can share because if we don't do it, somebody else will. And they may not be goals that we find at all worth uh, aligning with. And I think that's the danger we're in. So. I know it on the cinema. Uh, I don't go to the movies very often, but partly because of that, when I do go, I could notice the evolution of the form. And one thing that struck me the last time I went, that movies I've seen in the last few years include, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, Black Panther, Interstellar. Uh, I saw, I think, Psycho. Uh, it was a re rerun. Um, that not counting, but part of what is happening is a greater and greater immersive type of experience like where the consumer, the viewer, okay, um, is completely you know, hyper pampered. First of all, the seats are really comfortable. They're plush. You can put up your legs. You get a great view. The screen is huge. The audio is monstrous and you really feel it. And, of course, before the film begins, you're subjected to various messages, advertisements for, for you know, other films, um, different scripts, plots, characters, actors, directors. Uh, and, you know, somebody who's you know, culturally um, somewhat educated, I, when, I, when I go to the cinema, I'm decoding the messages that, that are coming at me. And I remember distinctly the last time that I went 
how as you know, all this information was streaming and pouring over me, really, completely immersed in this, in this theater, this, this dark cave of the soul. Um, I thought how this is the most amazing technology for getting people to feel a certain way. Uh, and how powerful it, it was and how um, in that realm of the, of the media and of the, the um, orchestration of experiences, of mass experiences, that there are distinct forces in play. There are distinct intentionalities involved with particular goals. They want people to feel a certain way about certain things. Uh, and I su- agree with some of them and don't agree with others. And part of my process of uh, absorbing that art form is to parse out, like, what am I really wanting to feel here? And what am I feeling uh, that is beyond uh, the the intended messages, perhaps? Uh, what, what's beyond what I've been able to feel before or have felt before? I, I think it's a very powerful medium. So, um, and it's it's the you know just a quick n- another note on that. It's such a collaborative effort to create a film. You need hundreds, thousands of people, people involved, millions of dollars. All of it has to be orchestrated. All of it has to be coordinated. All of it has to come in, you know, under, uh, at least, you know, on budget or, or under budget. There's, there's a lot at stake. Uh, and it's not always just for entertainment. Uh, it, it has to do with cohering a, a population's sense of itself. I think it has to do with the kind of larger process that Jeffrey was, was talking about. Um, and. Um, I think that the miss. I think that there's 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 a link uh, between the intellect and the affect uh, that is really elaborated in that art form, in any art form, um, in that art form in particular, uh, and and the link has a connection as well to this kind of theme of global stage, the global theater, because so much of I think of what we witness on the global stage. Trump's whole way of conducting himself, of conducting "quote unquote" policy, is theater. It's theatrical. It's creating this immersive kind of uh, experience, you know, of reality um, that suggests certain ways of feeling, certain certain ways of being. It, it was interesting to learn a, l- a little bit about this psychology of alf- alpha males. Um, you posted a link on this, Mark. Uh, what was surprising about it, what the, the, the quality I least expected to be present in alpha males, according to this, um, what was his name? I forgot the psychologist's name. Whatever, was empathy. Uh, the, the alpha male in the, in the group of chimpanzees or you know, whoever is being studied has to demonstrate empathy for the group as a whole. And uh, what we tend to associate with alpha males, the bullying and the abusive kind of behavior, this, the argument was, is not what an alpha male actually is. So that, made, that led me to ask I mean, and why we would invest so much power, so much um, importance uh, to actors on this larger stage in this larger theater of reality, quote unquote reality, who may not be displaying that quality. And is part of the problem that we're investing importance uh, and power in the wrong kind of leaders. Uh, And that we need to be looking for a kind of hyper empathy, a kind of ability to bring many more diverse factions together in a common resonance. And what would, what would that look like? What would that be? Well, I think leaders um, emerge out of social fields and those relational fields um, bring forward spoke persons who are trying to articulate that that network of relationships 
and um, and there are more than one group. Um, so I think uh, each of us are members of different groups, and as we move from group to group, we're bringing with us uh, the other experiences that we've had in another group. So, and some of those are maybe very traumatic, and some of them may be very beneficial, and some and they're they're mixtures. So. Um, I think our technology is just amplifying a lot of the, uh, the, the negatives um, because that's our nature. You know, we, we, we're attracted to the drama of the day. And the major gesture, I think, as, my, as Manning is pointing out to us, um, we forget those minor gestures that make those major gestures possible. You know, the Rosa Parks who decides that she's not going to stand up uh, on the back of the bus for, on the front of the bus for a white person. She just said, no, I'm not going to do that. And that, sh and that sh set in motion something in the field that had never been expressed before. So we may not all be uh, Rosa Parks, but I think some of us have been in those situations where because we said no, things around us changed. Or we might have said yes, and things around us may have changed. Um, but I think that's what I, I think our whole education has been based on this, this fearless leader principle, which I think is bogus. Um, I think we put way too much emphasis on, on, the, on the leader and how the leader establishes his or her leadership. And, um, we're, and I think there are other opportunities for creating a, a more ecological civilization, I think is going to come about when more of us find different ways of uh, satisfaction in, in, a, in, a, in a relational feel. Uh, maybe come, maybe about sharing our imaginations and uh, alternative stories rather than the highly structured pre-scripted story that most politics tends to manufacture. Our current politics, we, we may have a future politics, a future art, a future science that may not look anything like what it looks like now. Just like a hundred years ago, if you read about the social theories and what they said reality was, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Boy, were they lunatic. I mean, the, the, head, of, uh, the head of Harvard uh, refused women, wouldn't let women into law school because uh, he said, uh, and this is science he was drawing upon, because women, this was 100 years ago, women had a, a uterus and... Um, all the blood would go to their uterus that should be going to their brain if they were going to develop intellectually. <laughs> Therefore, yeah, that was, that was hardcore science. Therefore, we are not going to let women into our uh, higher learning because it's, it would be bad for them. It would be bad for their biologically. And it was Mary, I think Stanton is her name, great feminist. We're talking about 1890, something like that. And she, she spoke five languages. Her father was a lawyer. She, she was a, brilliant scholar in jurisprudence, and she had five children, you know, brilliant woman. And she said, that can't be right. <laughs> you know, I just, that's not right. And she created a whole campaign, which later become the suffragette movement. And I'm just saying that what we're, what we're now calling the facts are not the real facts. A hundred years from now, they're going to be howling at how naive we were or how naive we are. <clears throat> so anyway, I just want us to uh, just think about that, where science will be 100 years from now, if any of us are around. I don't think it's going to be the same science that it is now, or any of or the arts as well. Just look at movies. 100 years ago, movies was, there were a few silent pictures. That was about it. <clears throat> uh, going along with the... Uh alpha male study and empathy there's also a, a study that was done and i can't quote it that the higher up you go in power in the power structure something happens to your empathy you people that rise to power literally have to do more work to keep their empathy especially human beings i think <laughs> you know uh because i think my feel for it is that power is very addictive for all of us on a lot of different levels our use of power and i'm just speaking from my experience of having to um face death a couple of times that uh, 
that's probably the basis of a lot of power is how do we face death? Because that's one thing we don't have power over, you know? And I think that's, I, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, but it, I know it's an existential query, <laughs> you know, that I think just goes out to almost all the issues, <laughs> you know, that just, it, Woo. <laughs> uh, and I'm just speaking from my experience because of having to come face to face with death a couple of times. Do you think we're coming face to face with death on a civilizational yeah. level? Yeah. Exactly. Everybody's collectively, we're on the edge of feeling it. I think another important chart that was in that talk from DeWalls was his name. He was a Dutch uh, mm -hmm. researcher. He's a, he's a zoologist, I think. Yeah, yeah, he's a zoologist. Yeah, it, but one of one of the, the the chart that I liked the most was how stressed is the alpha male? Mm -hmm. Where he showed that, that's exactly what you were just saying, Michael. Michael, you you can be up there, but you you've got more of a burden. You got to balance all this stuff. You have to empathize. You have to call upon resources that you didn't know that you have. And the question for who leads or who is the leader is how long can you sustain that? And, and, and there are physical limits, I'm sure, to what, what different individuals can do, and so it changes. But whoever takes over that role, this is kind of like the gunslinger <laughs> syndrome. You know, if you can be the fastest gun in your West, and there's lots of people that are looking for you, period. That's, that's how it works. You have to know that when I do this, everybody's coming gunning for me. And the number of individuals who are willing to do that, knowing full well this is what's going to happen. I, I tend to think that a lot of our leaders today, especially the authoritarian ones, think they're immune to that, that gunslinger problem, that nobody's gonna actually come looking. Well, they are, and they're gonna get you, and you, may need, you, you will probably not see it coming when it comes as well, because there's a great demand that's being made, and if the demand is not being fulfilled, it can go along for a while, but at some point, it just is not possible any longer. It's just going to collapse in upon itself, and, and whoever is there has to be replaced. Part of the reason I think that people like Trump or others or Putin or Erdogan, or you, you, can, name, or you can name lots of them around the world today, they can sustain themselves as long as they do because they get all of their energy from us. We project it onto them. Right. We tell them that they are whatever it is that they are. And this can have a positive effect as well as a negative effect. Um, any, anybody, I think John can probably relate to this as well. If you're on the stage and if you are performing, there is a connection with the audience that relates directly to you. Yes. And whether it's theater or whether it's in business or whether it's anywhere, and that happens, and once you get that, either you relish that, you want the applause, if you will. You don't necessarily want the other stuff that goes with it, but you love the applause. We all do. But it places a burden on you that very, very few people that I have ever met are equipped to deal with. And you can, you can see how people just break down under that. Now, to me, you always have to be there when people break down if you're close to them. But, but it's very, very difficult to, you know, to, to sustain that. Lord Acton once said, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And he was, he was spot on with that as far as I'm concerned. Because it's the projection that you get from everyone else. And you have to take, and all projection is projection, but it's good projection and bad projection too that's coming. You, you got to take all of that. And I don't know many people <laughs> that can handle that in the end. But that is also not something that we talk about in mainstream a psychological discourse, for example, but anybody who's ever been there knows this is what's there, and you you know where and whom it's coming from, depending on the size of the group. Uh, Ed, would you consider uh, Gandhi and Martin Luther King gunslingers too? <laughs> People want gun in form. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, at the end, you know, the gunslinger. We we love that where where we we come from originally. 
those gunslingers, but somebody does eventually. Well, and they're 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 they hold power differently than the authoritarian, but there's somebody's coming after you. That's correct. Somebody's going to come out, and and both of them knew it. Yeah, both of them have made public statements about it, and if and when and however. It's not like it came as a surprise to them. It surprises yeah. the rest of us because somebody actually does it, but it's still there all the time. And and you're you are aware of that. Well, and I think in their case, and I'm just speculating. Because they held that so close to them, they knew how to hold power. Yes, yes. But they also did not have that fear of death, which which intimidates that's, them. That's, that's what I'm indicating. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I thought, that's what I thought I heard you saying. Yeah. It's a whole different relationship. But exactly. I, I just want to respond. I, I think I saw that Duval, I think his name, the zoologist who did that study, or he was talking about... Um, the alpha male yeah. syndrome. Uh, I think it was very interesting, uh, but I think there's something else that was sort of missing, uh, or maybe something I think just need to be added to, uh, that the, he was looking at primates and chimpanzees, and uh, he comes out of, uh, you know, biological evolution, um, and, but I think we're gonna have to give up on that one. I mean, and we, I, think we ca I think we're gonna have to say no to biological evolution, and I, I think there's much more going on with humans. Even though we experiment, we look at chimpanzees and the behaviors that chimpanzees exhibit, which is sort of like the language, but not quite. And maybe some words can be used by certain animals in certain very, very controlled environments with, with the other human beings. But I think, and the studies that we do on rats and all that, I, I think it's just, it's, it's, I think it's distorts as much as it might reveal. And um, I think there's much more going on with humans than with, with chimpanzees. And um, I think that, um, I think what you were talking about too, Ed, about leaders who take projections and they give and receive and they can project onto the crowd and the crowd projects back onto them, that transference and countertransference that happens. I don't think they talk about it too much because it sounds so magical because mm -hmm. I think its roots are in magic. And I think that, I think that I, but I also think with a two party system such as we have, um, it's pretty doomed to these kinds of uh, theatrics. And I remember one of our, the great writers of our American tradition is, is Emerson. And he wouldn't get into politics because he said the two party system was so corrupt. And that was in 1830. <laughs> So, I mean, I just think this, this whole thing is doomed. Um, and I don't care who, who wins or loses. It's, it's almost a, at this point uh, where I'm observing from uh, irrelevant. I think there's a, something else that's, that could happen. It might happen. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I won't ever vote again. I might. Um, but I think we, we just have to be um, um, what's gotten us here. So far, I think we, I think this next hurdle that we're going to have to, you know, find a way of, of uh, going past this next thing is going to be much more complex than, um, than what we've uh, assumed works. Um, and I think we're just going to have to sort of reframe and deframe and unframe a lot of what we think political is. It may be, I think Banerjee has something there when he said just about everything is political now. And uh, you can't really just say, oh, I'm going to study this or this or this without like also uh, dealing with the politics. Which, which is why, just one, one small comment. I, I don't think that we can eliminate evolution. I, I think it's there. I think it's, it's got us to, to where we are now. Where I do agree with you 100%, there's only 2% difference genetically between a chimpanzee and a human being. But I don't think the two are comparable or comparable on a, on a broad scale. I think there's lots of things that happen within the animal kingdom, especially with chimpanzees, that you can look at and you can say, yeah, I can see where, where that can come from. There are these, these connections. But we're in a position to do a lot more and a lot different things with ourselves and our environments than chimpanzees are. That, that, that's where the difference. And the, that 2% difference in genetic whatever resource makes all the difference in the world 
if it is in fact genetic. I, I believe that it goes beyond that and it's more than that, but it makes all the difference in the world. And that's what we have to focus more on and become more aware of if anything positive is going to come out of this. Because I, I firmly believe that whether we like it or not, we are going to be pushed evolutionary to another stage where we have to deal with whatever. Well, and, it, it, yeah, and it could be, and it could be as a result of that push because of where we are and what we're doing and how we react to it, we annihilate our, ourselves as a species. That may be, you know, that, that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the options I think that's in the realm of possibility. It doesn't have to be that way, but it could be. And we just have to recognize that, that that's part of the, you know, what, we're, what it is that we're dealing with. But I don't, think we have, I don't think we can just say, no, we're not gonna take the next leap. I think it's gonna push us. No, I, 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 maybe I, I should make myself clear. I'm a little fuzzy on this, but there's a difference between biological evolution, make as many babies as possible before you yeah, die. Okay. That's the biological imperative. No, well, that, 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 Nothing that's else your, really matters. Well, that, that's your spin on that, but and okay. A, I understand what you're saying. And then there's cultural evolution. And cultural oh. evolution, art, music, you know, literature, dance, movies, uh, storytelling, you know, that's another kind of evolution. And we are doing both at the same time. Yeah. And our, our cultural evolution can shape and influence and impact biological evolution. Oh, yes. I mean, drink and watching TV or sitting here in front of flat screens, that's changing our biology. Um, and that's, that's what I was just trying to point out clumsily, that there's this oh. interface between biological evolution and cultural evolution, I think that's what uh, Weinstein was pointing out, that we are culturally evolving to the point where we can now reflect upon our biological evolution and say no to some parts of it, perhaps. Yeah. Okay, okay. It can have an impact on that biological evolution. Yeah. And he's claiming that we must. So um, rather than just do the, the herding instinct thing, which we all, which we all know how to do. Um, unless so, another person say no to that, we really are doomed. So biology is not destiny, John, right? That's that's right. Okay, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. And I wouldn't say we're separate from it. I think it's all definitely. Okay, that's good. Well, that's, that's well, Aurobindo brings in a whole other level, which is spiritual yes, evolution. And I mean, his model and why I wanted to talk about ultimate reality is because, <laughs> he, because it, 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 neither biology nor culture is yeah. ultimately yep. real, I think, in, in, in this view. And those things are being driven by spirit. And then, then culture kind of condensates from that and biology content. He has this involutionary dimension kind of arc to, to the way that he understands reality. Um, and I, you know, we're barely dealing with culture that well. So I, I don't know. It's quite a leap to, to go to the, you know, the next order of being, if that's what it is. Um, but what I'm taking from him is that if our orientation spiritually is different than the current ontology, the current metaphysics, that that will have these downstream effects on culture and then ultimately you know, he calls it the divinization of matter. I'll just put that in quotes for now, but ultimately mm -hmm. biology as well. That's actually what I like so much about Aurobindo is that he brings in this third option that nobody really likes to talk about. <laughs> and he just kind of like plops this elephant on the table and everybody has to, has to talk around it. I find him very refreshing in that regard, if that's the right word to, to use. <laughs> Although Tyard Chardin does the same thing, so it's not entirely it's, right. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not saying he's the only guy that's done it, Trevor. I agree with you 100%. There's, I, there's like a handful I can go, well, they've been, everybody's, and they're, it's, it's not quite the same elephant. No, it's not quite the same. But, but it's an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> they're not quite the same, but they're like, well, they're the same. You know, like well, I don't know, but it's on the table. I think it's an. <laughs> I think we well, might find one, out. That it's one a is a Catholic and one is a 
is yeah, a, yeah, I know that, that, know, that, that, that whole thing, right? It's a, different. So it's like it's got a different color on it. What happens when the elephant flies? <laughs> and that's a well, flying we, elephant, as far as we've got Dumbo coming up, so <laughs> I know it's already been anticipated. <laughs> okay. This, okay, Disney can see all, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah but uh, i gotta go guys it's about time for me to go too it stopped raining i better go out and do my shopping <laughs> yeah, go do something productive for a change John. <laughs> I well, I'm, on, I'm on vacation I so i have to spend time with my with my brothers oh no. well <laughs> right. bye enjoy, guys enjoy that thank you bye okay. everyone